Hello, this is part 13 of the old math journey in Khan Academy. So yeah, representing data, let's go. But what I want to do in this video is think about all of the different ways. Yeah, we're recording and I can hear myself. Cool. Is that we can rep What I want to do in this video is think about all of the different ways that we can represent data. So right over here, we have a list of, and I'm just using this as one form of data, a list of student scores on, say, the last test. So Amy got 90% right, Bill got 95% right, Cam got 100% right, Efra got, also got 100% right, and Farah got 80% right. This is one way to show data. Remember, data is just recorded information, and it could be numeric like this, it could be quantitative, so you're recording actual numbers, or it could even be things, you could record data on how did they like the test, and they could have scored it uh, based on I really liked it, I kind of liked it, I didn't like it. Or they might have rated it on a scale of zero to five, which would have been numbers, but it's numbers that are measuring people's opinions, as opposed to uh, here, we have numbers that are measuring their actual scores. So there's all different types of data, and I don't want to get into all of that. But let's just start thinking about different ways to represent this data. So this is one way. You could view this as a table, where you have the name, let me, and then you have the score. Yeah. So you have your name column, and then you have your score. Go back you could view seconds. this as a table, where you have the name, let me, and then you have the score. So you have your name column, and then you have your score column, and I could construct it as a table. So it clearly looks like a table like that. That's one way, one very common way of representing of representing data, just like that. That's actually how most traditional databases record data in tables like this. But you could also do it in other ways. So you could record it as a, as a, oftentimes called a bar graph or sometimes a histogram. So you could put score on the vertical axis here, and then you could have your names over here. And let's see the scores. Let's see, maybe I'll make this a 50. Actually, let me just mark them off. So this is 10, 20, 30, no, that's too big. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. So that's, and then 100. So that's 100. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That would be 50 right over there. And then you could go person by person. So Amy. Amy record, got a 90 on the exam. So the bar will go up to 90. So that is Amy. And then you have Bill got a 95. So it's going to be between 90 and 100. So it's going to be right over there. Bill got a 95. And so it would look like this. Bill. So that is Bill. And then you have Cam, who got 100 on the exam. So make sure. Now, see, I'm hand drawing it. So it's not, as, it's not as precise as if I were to do it on a computer. So this right over there, that is Cam's score. Ephra got the same score as Cam. So her score is going to be, let me do that in the color, in Ephra's color. That's Ephra's score right now there. She also got 100. So Ephra. Ephra. And then finally, Farah got an 80. So 60, 70, 80. So Farah got, got an 80. So this is Farah's score right over here. So this is another way of representing the data. And here we see it in visual form, but it has the same information. You can look up someone's name and then figure out their score. Amy scored a 90. Bill scored a 95. Cam scored 100. Ephra also scored 100. Farah scored an 80. And there's even other ways you can have some of this information. In fact, sometimes you might not even know their names. And so then it would be less information, but it might just be a list of scores. The professor might say, hey, here are the five scores that, were, were, that people got on the exam. And they would list 90, 95, 95, 100, 100, 100, and 80. Now, if it was listed in, if this was all of the data you got, this would be less information than the data that's in this bar graph or this histogram. 
and or the data that's given in this table right over here. Because here, not only do we know the scores, but we know who got what Thanks. score. Here, we only know the list of scores. But there's even other ways, and I, this, is, this, is an, an, this is not an exhaustive video of all of the different ways you can represent data. You could also represent data by looking at the frequency of scores. So the frequency of scores right over here. So instead of writing the people, you could write the scores. So let's see, you could say this is 80, 85, 90, 95, and 100. And then you could record the frequency that people got these scores. So how many times do you have a score of an 80? Well, Farah got a, is the only person with a score of 80, so you put one data point there. No one got an 85. One person got a 90, so you put a data point there. One person got a 95, so you could put that data point right over there. And then two people got 100. So this is one and two. Let's see, the other 100 is in this color, so I'll just do it in the color. You wouldn't necessarily have to color code it like this. So this is another way to represent, and this is, you know, in this axis you could just view this as the number. So this tells you how many 80s there were, how many 90s there are, how many 95s, and how many 100s. So this, right over here, has the same data as this list of numbers. It's just another way of looking at it. And once you have your data arranged in any of these ways, we can start to ask interesting questions. We can ask ourselves things like, well, what is the range of data? What is the range in the data? And the range is just the spread between the lowest point and the highest point. So the range in this data is going to be the difference between the highest score, and the highest score is our 100, and the lowest score, an 80. So the range is going to be the difference between the max minus the min, the maximum score minus the minimum score. So it's going to be 100 minus 80 is equal to 20. So that gives you a sense of things. It kind of gives you a sense of spread. You could also ask yourself, well, how many, how many people scored below 100? And these are just interesting questions. Below 100. And you could actually answer that question. Well, actually, you could have answered either of these questions with any of these different ways of looking at the data. If you say, how many people scored below 100? Well, one, two, three. How many people scored below 100? Well, 100 is up here, so it's going to be one, two, three. How many people scored below 100? One, two, three. How many people scored below 100? One, two, three. And so any way you look at it, you would have gotten three. And you could also ask yourself, what is the most frequent score? So most frequent. Most frequent. And once again, you could answer that question with any of these ways of representing this data. You could look at our original table and you say, look, there's only 190, 195, 180. There's two hundreds. So you'd say, look, there's the most frequent score is 100. You'd see that over here too. You actually have two hundreds. There's only one of each of the other scores. Here you also see the two hundreds. And here is probably the clearest if you're looking at frequency. Sometimes this might be called a frequency plot. And sometimes it's called a, a well, the, 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 sometimes the official, well, <laughs> it's Not often called a frequency plot, a plot. And you see here, the most frequent one is the one that has the most dots on it, which is 100. So anyway, that's just a very high level overview of how you can look at data and different ways to, to represent data. But the one thing I really want you to get from this is that these are all different ways of representing the same data. And we could probably invent other ways of doing it as well. Data set warm up. The digits from the serial number of a dollar bill are listed below. What digit in the serial number of this dollar occurs most often? Let's see, I guess 8 occurs most often, like 4 times it's prepared. Loosen up the volume of gas and liters in a tank of each car in today's race. How many drivers were in today's race? Okay, I think there's 6 drivers, I guess. Animal crackers in each kid's lunchbox. Number of animal crackers. Kid. <laughs> uh, Sarah, Cactor, Yuti, and Anthony. How many kids have fewer than six animal crackers? Oh, okay, fewer than six, it's gonna be three of them. Yuti, Anthony, and Sarah, three kids. Uh, Justin did push ups every day this week. He did eight push ups on Monday. Four in push ups on Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday. And on Wednesday, six on Thursday. Eight on Friday, nine on Saturday, and 12 on Sunday. What is the maximum number of push-ups that Justin 
did in a day this week. Am I supposed to say 18? How many pitchers pitched in the tournament? A number of innings. What's that even supposed to mean? Innings pitched by each pitcher in a tournament. How many pitchers pitch in the tournament? I'm supposed to say five. Those are five pitchers. I don't know what's this uh, Habala boost about. Oh my god, okay. Uh, I could be wrong about this one. How many pitchers? Okay, cool. Uh, three Sundays. Uh, Sundays, each store made on Monday. Sundays made on Monday. Uh, okay. Three Sundays. Okay. How many stores made more than 10 Sundays on Monday? Oh, it's made on Monday. Sunday's made on Monday. Made on Monday. Uh, each of these is three. So we would have to need four of those. Made more than ten. So four. It's going to be twelve. So how many stores? This store. This three of them. Three stores made more than ten. The following data points represent the number of chocolate chips in each cook of the cookies that can fall. What is the maximum number of chocolate chips? Chips in a cookie. Wait, what? And the other percent the number of chocolate chips in each of the chocolate chips in each of the cookies that can What's that? What is the number of chocolate chips in a cookie? Nine. warm up. Cool. Okay, let's go. Stem and lip lights. A statistician for a basket I'm recording Phil. Am I recording? Eleven minutes. Ball team track the number of points. Hello. Hello. Okay. My hair sucks. I, Stat I need the haircut. A statistician for a basketball team tracked the number of points that each of the twelve players on the team had in one game. And then made a stem and the leaf plot to show the data. And sometimes it's called a stem plot. How many points did this team score? And when you first look at this plot right over here, it seems a little hard to understand. Under stem, you have 0, 1, 2. Under leaf, you have all of these digits here. How does this relate to the number of points each student or each player actually scored? And the way to interpret a stem and leaf plot is the leaves contain, at least the way that this statistician used it, the leaf contains the, the smallest digit or the ones digit in the number of points that each player scored. And the stem contains the tens digits. And usually the leaf will contain the, the, the rightmost digit or the ones digit. And then the stem will contain all of the other digits. And what's useful about this is it gives kind of a distribution of where the players were. You see that most of the players scored points that started with a 0, then a few more scored points that started with a 1, and then only one score scored points that started with a 2, and it was actually 20 points. So let me actually write down all of this data in a way that maybe you're a little bit more used to understanding it. So I'm going to write the zeros in purple. So there's, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 players had 0 as the first digit. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I wrote 7 zeros. And then this player also had a 0 in his 1's digit. This player, I'm going to try to do all the colors. This player also had a 0 in his 1's digit. This player right here had a 2 in his 1's digit, so he scored a total of 2 points. This player, let me do orange. This player had 4 for his 1's digit. This player had 7 for his 1's digit. Then this player had 7 for his 1's digit. And then, let me see, I'm almost using all the colors. This player had 9 for his 1's digit. So the way to read this is you had one player with 0 points, 0, 2, 4, 7, 9, and 9. But you can see, I mean, it's kind of silly saying the 0 was a 10's digit. You could have even put a blank there. But the 0 lets us know that they didn't score, they didn't score anything in the 10's place. But these are the actual scores for those 7 players. Now let's go to the next row in the stem and leaf plot. So over here, all of the digits start with, or all of the points start with 1 for each of the players. And there's four of them. So 1, 1, 1, and 1. 
And then we have this player over here. It's one his ones digit or her ones digit is a one. So this player this represents eleven. One in the tens place, one in the ones place. This player over here also got eleven. One in the tens place, one in the ones place. This player let me do orange. This player has three in the ones place. So he or she scored thirteen points. One in the tens place. What three in the ones place? Thirteen points, and then I will do this in purple. This player has eight in their ones place, so he or she scored eighteen points. One in the tens place, eight in the ones place, eighteen points, and then finally, you have this player that has two. the The tens digit is a two, and then the ones digit is a zero. Is a zero. I'll circle that in yellow. It is a zero. So he or she scored 20 points. So using the using it, looking at the stem and leaf plot, we were able to extract out all of the number of points that all of the players scored. And once again, what was useful about this is you see how many players scored between zero and nine points, including nine points. How many scored between 10 and 19 points, and then how many scored 20 points or over. And you see the distribution right over here. But let's actually answer the question that they're asking us to answer. How many points did the team score? So here we just have to add up all of these numbers right over here. So we're going to add up, I'll start with the largest. So 20 plus 18 plus 13 plus 11 plus 11, 13, 11, 11, plus 9 plus 7 plus 7 again, plus 4 plus 2. Did I do that right? We have two 11s. Then a nine, then two sevens, then a four, then a two, and then these two characters didn't score anything. So let's add up all of these together. Let's add them all up. So zero plus eight is eight, plus three is eleven, plus one is twelve, plus one is thirteen, plus nine is twenty-two, plus seven is twenty-seven, thirty-four, thirty-eight, thirty, or forty. So that gets us to 40. Let me do that one more time. 8, 11, 11, 12, 13, 13 22, 22, 29, 29, 29 29, 36, and then 20, <laughs> 29, 36, 36 40, 40, and 42. 40. Looks like I actually might have messed. Let me do that one more time. This is the hardest part, adding mm -hmm. these up. So let me try that one last time. I'm just going to state where my sum is. So 0, 8, at 3, 11. 12, 13, 22, 29, 36, 40, 42. So it's a good thing that I double checked that. I had made a mistake the first time. 4 plus 2 is 6. 7, 8, 9, 10. So we get to 102 points. The team in total scored 102 points. OK, cool. 102 points, cool. Reading stem and leaf plots. The government created the following stem and leaf plot showing the number of turtles at each major zoo in the country. How many zoo zoos have fewer than 46 turtles? So what the stem, stem and leaf prop plot does is it gives us the first digit less in each number. And the, essentially you could say it called us the tens place. And then it gives us the ones place. So there was only one zoo that had four turtles. So you could view this as zero, zero, four, or four turtles. Then there's, well, let's see, so, so everything here, the tens place is a one. So this, this number right over here is really an 11. This is a 14. This right over here would be a 16. Uh, That's a 16. 12, 10, 10. And so forth and so on. This would be 17, is, uh, 18. All six, of this, this is 23, 12, this is 23, this is 26, because we have our tens place right over here. 16, this is the first 17. digit. So let's go ahead and answer the question. How many zoos had fewer than 46 turtles? So there are no zoos that had 40 anything turtles. And so all of these zoos here, so all of these had 30 something turtles, this, these had 20 something turtles, these have in the teens, this have single digits. So it's literally as many zoos as we have listed here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 17 zoos have fewer than 46 turtles. Let's do another one. The buyer for a chain of supermarkets created the following stem and leaf plot showing the number of coconuts at each of the stores. What was the smallest number of coconuts at any one grocery store? So the buyer for a chain of supermarkets created the following stem of leaf plots showing the number of coconuts at each of the stores. 
So at any one grocery store, the smallest number, well, that's this one right over here. And remember, it's not two. We have our tens places right over here. It's a one. So this right over here represents 12 coconuts at that store. So we'll put 12 right over here. Let's try it on another one. A statistician for a chain of department stores created the following stem and leaf plot showing the number of watches at each of the stores. How many department stores have exactly seven watches? One store. Well, that's only this one right over here. Zero, seven watches. This one right, this, this, and that one are not seven. This is representing 17 because it's in the row with one at the beginning. This right over here represents 27 so because it's in the row with the two at the beginning. So there's only one store that has exactly seven watches. Let's do one more. This is kind of fun. A zookeeper yeah. created the following stem and leaf plot showing the number of tigers at each major zoo in the country. How many zoos have more than 24 tigers? So we can ignore the zeros and the teens, and we get into the 20s. This is 25, so that meets the criteria. And then you go to 28, 29. So all of these, all of these in the 30s, and all of these right over here. This three zero. This doesn't mean zero tigers. This is 30 tigers. This is 40 tigers. So we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Nine zoos have more than 24 tigers. And we're Nine done. zoos. And we're done. Okay, stem and leaf plots. The government published the following stem and leaf plots showing the number of tigers at the major zoo in the country. Key, two, five, seven, five tigers. Yeah. How many zoos are exactly have 27 tigers? Okay, it's two, two zoos, have 27 tigers. Pair of boots at each of the store. Uh, how many department stores have more than 60? Well, no department store. Uh, how many zoos have fewer than 26 lizards? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. A 4, 4, 9, yeah, cool. Oh, fuck, this is 2, oh my god. Holy crap. Ah, uh, it's okay. It's from it's, what's the smallest number of lizards of any one? Uh, twenty. Holy shit! I believe I messed that up. How many zoos exactly have forty lizards? Uh, one zoo. How many zoos have more than twenty-six lizards? Twenty-six. More than twenty-six. This is exactly one, two, three. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 zoos. How many zoos have fewer than 13? And two of them have fewer than 13. What is the largest number of bears at any one zoo? Uh, 50 bears. Okay, cool. Let's do the quiz. Let's do the quiz. Most frequent number it's two. No, no, the actual zero, not two. Uh, okay, how many department stores have exactly 37 per pair of points? I just won. Uh, what is the minimum number of points scored by each player? Wait, what? Number of points scored last game by each player in the dragon. It's basketball. What was the minimum number of points scored? Oh, by a player. I thought by each player. How many zoos have more than 13 tigers? So, it's more than 13. More than 13, right? One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How many brands of raisin bran are shown in the table? Uh, four racing brands, I guess. Nice. Oh, oh wow, this is pretty quick. Just video watching and all.
Pictograph. According to the pictograph below, how many survey respondents have type O positive blood? How many have O negative blood? So a pictograph is really just a way of representing data with pictures that are somehow related to the data. So in this case, they give us little pictures of, I'm assuming, blood drops right over here. And then they tell us that each blood drop each blood drop in this pictograph represents eight people. So you can kind of view that as a scale of these graphs. Each of these say eight people. So for example, if you say how many people have A positive, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven blood drops. But each of those blood drops represent eight people. So it would be 56 people have type A positive. But let's answer the actual question that they're asking. Yeah, 16 How people. many survey respondents have type O positive? O positive. So this is O, and then we care o about O positive. Blood. So well, we have one blood drop, two, three. Let me do this in a new different color. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six eight. Four. So we have eight drops. I'll put those in quotes because it's pictures of drops. And then the scale is. The scale is eight people, eight people, let me write it this way, times eight people per drop. Eight people per drop. And so eight times eight, and actually even the drops, you can view them as canceling out if you view them as units. So drops, drops. Eight times eight is equal to 64, wow. 64 people. So they could have written literally the number 64 right over here. 64 people have type O positive blood. Now let's think about the O negative case. O negative blood. Well, this is O, and then within the blood group O, this is O negative, and we have one drops, two drops. So we have two drops, two drops times eight people per drop. Eight people per drop. And so two times eight, each of these represent eight. So eight and then 16, or two times eight is equal to 16, 16 people. So 16 of the survey respondents, 16 have type O negative, 64 have type O positive. Reading a bar ground. 20 teachers were asked about their favorite course. Seven teachers said language, three teachers said history, nine teachers said geometry, one teacher said chemistry, zero teachers said physics. Create a bar chart showing everyone's favorite courses. So we've got the bar chart right over here, and let's see what we need to plot. So it said zero teachers said physics, which is surprising to me, because since physics is arguably my favorite course. But let's plot what the data has. So physics, so right now it looks like it's halfway between zero and one, so I actually have to bring the physics down to zero. Let's see, chemistry, wow. they said, let's see, one teacher said chemistry. So we gotta bring chemistry up to one. Now, nine teachers said geometry. So geometry, let's bring that up to nine. One teacher said chemistry. Oh, I already read that. History, history, three teachers said history. So let's bring history up to three. And then language, seven teachers said language. So let's move this up to seven. And I think uh, we, if I didn't make any careless mistakes, we should be done. Yep, very good. Okay, that's really quick. Like Based it. on the data below, which student score improved the most between the midterm and final exams? And so they give us this data in terms of a bar graph for each student. We actually have two bars that show the midterm in blue and then the final exam in red. And they right. tell us that here, midterm in blue and final exam. And sometimes this is called a two column bar graph because for each student here, you have two columns of data. So if you were to actually look at the data itself, you have the midterm data and then you have the final exam data. Now, they're asking us which student score improved the most between the midterms and the final exams. So if we look at Jasmine right over here, might as well start with her since she's the most to the left. It looks like she definitely did improve from the midterm to the final. It looks like in the midterm, if I had to guess, this looks like about a, I don't know, it looks like she got maybe about a 72 or a 73 on the midterm. I'm just sure. guessing because I don't know the exact number. And it looks like on the final she got, I don't know, that looks like maybe a 77 or 78 approximately. So she improved a little bit, about five points from the midterm to the final. The way that they've given us this information, we don't know the exact numbers because it's not, it's not super precise in terms of marking off the bars, but hopefully it will become obvious when we look through everyone's scores. Let's look at Jeff. So Jeff, Jeff actually did worse from the midterm to the final exam. He got 
he got looks like over an 85 on the midterm, and then on the final he got about an 84 or an 85. So he actually went down. So it's definitely not Jeff. He definitely did not improve the most. Jasmine, he actually went down. Nevin, Next, if you think about Nevin, yeah, it looks like no. Nevin actually improved about the same much, uh, same amount as Jasmine on both scores. Uh, I don't know if Nevin is a boy or a girl's name. This person on both tests, this person did better than Jasmine, but it looks like the actual improvement's about the same. Looks like they went from about an 83 to, I don't know, about an 88. I'm just estimating it, just trying to look at look at this axis right over there and estimating what those scores are. So Nevin and Jasmine right now, based on the three we've seen, are tied for the lead. Now let's look at Alejandra. Now Alejandra, this is, okay, so this jumps out. She definitely improved dramatically from the midterm to the final exam. It looks like on the midterm she maybe got an 81 or an 82. So maybe this was an 82 she got on the midterm. And then on the final, it looks like she got about a 95. A 95 on the final. So it's dramatic improvement. So right now, Alejandra is the leading contender for most improved from the midterm to the final. And then finally, Marta, right over here, it looks like she actually worse. got worse from the midterm to the final. She scored in the mid-90s in the midterm and then low 90s in the final. So she's definitely not the most improved. So the winner here is Alejandra. Alejandra is the most improved between the midterm and the final exam. James counted the number of alligators in various local bodies of water and graphed the results. How many fewer alligators are in Bite Swamp than Chomp Lake and Reptile Creek combined? Oh, shit. So down here we have this bar thing. graph that James or somehow survived map. to create after going to all these bodies of water and counting the alligators. We'll hope he was behind a fence or something. So then we're asked, how many fewer alligators are in Bite Swamp than in Chomp Lake and Reptile Creek combined. So we need to know first how many are in Chomp Lake and Reptile Creek combined before we can figure out how many fewer are in oh, Bite shit, Swamp. 6, 9, 15, 12, so let's look down here. Less. Here's Chomp Lake sounding super three scary. Fewer. And its bar lines up to six. So there's six alligators in Chomp Lake. Plus in Reptile Creek, if we go over here to Reptile Creek, this bar lines up to nine, so there's nine alligators hanging out in Reptile Creek. Six plus nine, let's see, nine plus one is ten, so we can make our six into a five and a one. Nine plus one is ten, plus five more equals fifteen. So there's a total of fifteen alligators in Chomp Lake and Reptile Creek combined. Now we can answer how many fewer than 15 are in Bite Swamp. So Bite Swamp down here, sounding the most dangerous of them all, has a bar that lines up to 12. So 12, there's 12 alligators in Bite Swamp. Danger reverse. So how many fewer is stuff. 12 than the amount in Chomp Lake and Reptile Creek combined? 15. So how much fewer is 12 than 15? Well, if we have 15 and we take 12 away, that leaves us with 3. There are 3 fewer alligators in Bite Swamp than there are in Chomp Lake and Reptile Creek combined. In this video, we're going to talk about another way of visualizing data called the histogram. Okay, it's not paused, it's recording. Histogram, which is a very fancy word for a not so fancy thing. And I think it's probably fair to say that the histogram is the most used way of representing statistical data. And let me just show you how to figure out a histogram for some data, and I think you're going to get the point pretty easily. So I have some data here, and I want to represent it with a histogram. What we're going to see is how frequent are each of these numbers. And in order to figure that out, let me just write the numbers down and let me just categorize them in their respective buckets. So I have a 1 here. So I have 1, 1 right there. I have a 4. Let me put, so I want to leave space for the 2, the 3, and put a 4 there. 
I have a 2. That 2, I have a 1. Let me put that 1 on a stack right above that 1. I have a 0. Let me put the 0 to the left of the 1. I want to put them in order. I have a 2, another 2. Let me stack that above my first 2. I have another 1. Let me stack that above my other two ones. I have another 0. Let me stack it there. I have another 1. Another 1 right there. Then I have another 2. Another two, another one, another one. Another I have two one. more zeros. Oh, no. Zero, zero, zero. I have two more twos, two more twos. I have a three. I have a three. I have two more ones, two more one ones. And another one. Another three. And then I have a six. So no fives, and then I have a six. And that space right there was unnecessary. But right here, I've listed, I've just rewritten these numbers, and I've essentially categorized them. Now what I want to do is calculate how many of each of these numbers we have. So let me go down here. So I want to look at the frequency of each of these numbers. The frequency of each of these numbers. So I have one, two, three, four zeros. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 ones. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 twos. I have 1, 2, threes. I have 1, 4, and 6, and sorry, and 1, one six. 6. So we could write it this way. We could write the number, the number, and then we can have the frequency. The frequency. And so I have the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. We can even throw 5 in there, although 5 has a frequency of 0. And we have a 6. So the 0 showed up 4 times in this data set. 1 showed up 7 times in this data set. 2 showed up 5 times. 2 showed up 5 times. 3 showed up 2 times. 4 showed up 1 time. 5 didn't show up. And 6 showed up one time. So all I did is I, I counted this data set. I mean, I did this first. But you could say, how many times do I see a 0? I see it 1, 2, 3, 4 times. How many times do I see a 1? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times. That's what we mean by frequency. Now, a histogram is really just a plot, a kind of a bar graph, plotting the frequency of each of these numbers. It's going to look a lot like this original thing that I drew. So let me draw some axes here. So the different buckets here are the numbers. And that worked out because we're dealing with very clean integers that tend to repeat. If you're dealing with things that are more, uh, that aren't just, you know, that the exact number doesn't repeat, oftentimes people will put the numbers into buckets or ranges. But here they fit into nice little buckets. So you have the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. This is the actual numbers. And then on the vertical axis, we're going to plot the frequency. We're going to plot the frequency. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So 0 shows up four times. So we'll draw a little bar graph here. 0 shows up four times. Draw it just like that. 0 four shows up four times. That is that information right there. 1 shows up 7 times. 1 shows up 7 times. So I'll do a little bar graph. 1 shows up 7 times, just like that. 1 shows, I want to make it a little bit straighter than that. 1 shows up 7 times. 1 shows up 7 times. 2, 2, I'll do it in a different color. 2 shows up 5 times. 2 shows up 5 times. Do a bar graph, go all the way up to 5. 2 shows up 5 times. 3 shows up 2 times. 3 shows up exactly 2 times here. We have 1, 3, 2, 3's. 4 shows up 1 time here. So 4 shows up 1 time. 5 doesn't show up at all. 5 doesn't show up at all. So we can even, you know, doesn't even get any height there. And then finally, finally, 6 shows up. 6 shows up one time. So I'll do 6 showing up one time. What I just plotted here, this is a histogram. 
This right here is a histogram. Very fancy word, but I think you will agree it's a fairly simple idea. Figure out the frequency of each of these numbers, and then plot the frequency of each of these numbers, and you get yourself a histogram. For the past year, a travel agency has collected data about the number of individual tickets that it sells for its signature product, a Mediterranean cruise. The monthly data on ticket sales is shown below. What are the best and worst months for cruise sales? So what they've given us this diagram, this is best usually called a pie chart or pie graph June. because it looks like a pie that's sliced up into a bunch of pieces. Sometimes this is called a circle graph, but pie graph is much more common. And then they say it's monthly ticket sales. So each of these slices represent the sales in a given month. Yeah, so for example, this blue course. slice over here represents the sales in January. And the way that a pie chart is set up, oh, each January slice is bigger or smaller depending on what it's fraction it's of the whole it represents. So for example, they're telling us in January they sold 18% of the total year's ticket sales in January. So if you add up all of these percentages, it should add up to 100%. And not only do they tell us that they sold 18%, but the slice of this pie should be 18% of the area of the entire pie. It is literally 18% of the pie. If you were to eat this slice, you would have eaten 18% of the pie. Now with that out of the way, let's think, of, let's think about their questions. What are the best and the worst months for cruise sales? So the best month is obviously the month where they sell, where they have the largest or the largest percentage of their tickets were sold. And actually, I started with January, and if you just and this is what's neat about pie graphs, you wouldn't even have to look at the numbers. January just jumps out as the biggest slice of pie. If you didn't even see the numbers, if you couldn't even read, and you just looked at this, and someone said, "What is the largest slice of pie?" You would immediately say, "Hey, this is clearly the largest slice of pie right over there." And so that is actually the best month for cruise sales because they sold 18%. You see, this 18% is larger than all of the other percentages over here, but it's clear just by looking at the graph. This is the largest slice. Now what's the worst month for cruise ticket sales? The worst month? Well then we just have to find the thinnest slice of pie. And if we look over here, the, the slices of pie get pretty thin out down here. This is in the summer in June and July and in May. But the smallest are actually July and June. And this is where the numbers become useful because when you when you just look at it by, you know, when you just eyeball it, you're not sure, hey, are these exactly the same or do they just look exactly the same? And that's where these numbers are valuable. And based on the data they've given us, it looks like these are tied for the worst in terms of ticket sales. In both of these months, they sell only 3% in each month. So the worst months for cruise sales are July and June. July and June are tied for the worst. The best is clearly January. And then after January, the next best, I, I, they're not really asking us that, but since we have the pie chart in front of us, might as well ask ourselves that. What's the next best? Well, it looks like November is slightly better than December, but in general, in general, it's pretty clear that the winter months, the winter months do much better in terms of cruise sales than these over here, and I guess people are looking to get away from, from the cold. Wow, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. How many bana total bananas did the store sell on Tuesday? Bananas sold on Tuesday. Oh shit, all of these? Wow, this is tricky. It's half. So I guess four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, eleven, uh, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and six. Wow, no way. Let's see. One, two, three, four, 
5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 times 6. Are you insane? Are you insane? 3, 6 times 6, 36. Oh shit, why did I turn into 1? Holy fuck. I multiplied by 3. It's 96. Benitez. Uh, current. We'll ship it. Current eight five PG apples and drop four gala apples. After current eight and drop the two apples, which two types? What the fuck? Current pick apples at the Carter Apple Orchard this way. And she made a grab to show how many apples she picked. Current eight five PG apples. Five PG. So it's gone. And drop four gala. Four. Are you fucking kidding me? You only have three and a half. What do you have? How do you drop four? Okay, maybe the, the last one is half. Also, it's still on four still. After current eight and drop those apples. Uh, which two types have the same number of apples? None. Yo, you only have uh, Granny Smith and. Oh, it's actually Rome and Fiji. Or Rome and Fiji, right? What? Are you kidding me? Fiji. So you only have one left, and Rome only has one. Which two types have the same number of apples? Rome has one, Fiji has one. So it should be Rome and Fiji. Fuck, are you kidding me? Which two types have the same number of apples? Oh, it's, it's two. Oh, let's try this again. Let's try this again. Okay. Karen picked out cigar into this weekend. She made a grab how many apples she picked. So it's two, uh, four, five, it's five. It's two, uh, uh it's this, two, it's twelve. And. It's this uh, six, seven, four, uh, fourteen. This is six and seven. This is three. And Karen ate five Fiji apples. So, so you only have like seven left. You dropped four gala. So you have three. So you have gala and granny Smith. Gala and granny. Cool. Okay. Mandy Science. Man, this science class can only pose an outlet belt. How many more rib bones were there than skull and jaw bones combined? Okay, skull and jaw. No, oh, jaw is none, skull, so two. Rib bones. R rib bones, after six, so there's four more bones. Let's try again. Nancy put 80 acorns in her backyard. Then she made a graph how many acorns acorns different types of squirrels ate. Four acorns. Ground flying fox gray. How many acorns were left after the squirrels ate? Um okay. Uh one Let's see. See again. She had 80 acorns to start with. Then she okay, so all of these times four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and then fifteen. 16 times 4, you have 64. So 80 minus. Uh, it's gonna be 16, right? There's cross 16. Uh, Iris is heading his recycling drive, and Shard Village gives a number of kilograms of each kind of recycling for the drive.
Okay, times 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now we have 2, we have 4, 6, 10, 20, 60. Uh, Olivia counted the number of play bucks on each plant on her garden. Then she made a graph. If ten lady bugs fly from the latest to the al alfalfa, which two kinds of plants will have the same number of lady bugs? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have five. We have fifteen. We have twenty-five. We have ten. So zero, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, twenty-five. Then okay. If ten lady bugs from lettuce to alfalfa, so this becomes five only, and this becomes thirty-five. So we have roses and alfalfa. Oh, alfalfa. Uh, the pairing of the flower on Ori's garden over several months. How many flowers? How many fewer flowers did Ori have in her garden? In March and July combined then may okay so there's no half flowers here so i'd say just five then one two three four five six seven so two and then six flowers okay great park that's not my part it's pretty fast uh, Lewis, Louisa planted 100 seeds for each kind of crop in her garden. Uh, however, only seeds of this grew, of the seeds grew into seedlings. Great Warrior Shaman seedlings grew for each type of crop. Um, okay, so pumpkin 60, squash 90, lettuce 50, tomato 60 as well. Sweet. Zucchini is 30. Make a credit chart and work with the numbers of the machine. Label each bar graph. Okay. Oh, okay. So this one's um, 90. So invention, convention. This one's exactly 80. So this one's swap works. Uh, this one's 60. Echo station. And this one's 70 around the world. And this one's 110, which is history theater. Oh. The table below shows the number of students in each grade at Tobler Elementary School. Which graph below shows the most reasonable scale for the information in the table? What? Oh, okay. So I guess okay by that so first second third you have uh, 75 to 100 hmm. first second third fourth first second third fourth so, so just one answer I guess the ones by 25 makes sense yeah of course uh, on the family road trip, Ivy's playing a game where she counts the number of different colored cars. Uh, create a show many cars. Create a bar graph. Create a red. Twelve. Blue cars. Twenty. Silver cars. Twelve. Again. Black cars. Sixteen. Green cars. Four. Mercury, 24, that's Jupiter, uh, 14, that's Mars, yep, and is it 18, Saturn, the most, 26, I guess, is Venus. Uh, then we'll show the number of bugs eaten by four different salamanders.
What's up with the four? Didn't you? Uh, Sally Fraser. So we have like, these are all by two. Oh, okay. Uh, twenty-two to forty. James is 36, AG is 54, Minnelli is 36 again, Simone is 30, and stuff or Kira. Okay. Uh, read bar graphs, two step problems. Hey, ready? This was the video bite swamp bite swamp stuff uh chump lake and reptile creek chump lake is six and then sixteen four oh my gosh cool uh alice graph how many books in the school library are are about her favorite subjects Alice has read 10 of these books. How many books about Alice Harris House that she has not read are in her library? What? What does this even mean? Alice grabs, grabs how many books in the library, in the school library, are about her favorite subjects. So, uh, this much 25, 15, 30, and 40. Right? And Alice had read 10 of these books. How many books about Southern Sienna read? Oh, okay. So this is going to be the total the difference, right? Okay, cool. Difference, I guess. So 40, uh, 70, uh, plus 25, we have 8, 95, plus 15, 110, 100 books, Alice. The graph shows the number of students in each of Julia's classes. After Julia made the gr graph, 8 more students joined her cl science class. Uh, okay, science class twenty eight. Which class is the fewest students? Math. Anne counted the number of hurricanes that occurred over four months and graphed the results. What's the total number of hurricanes in those four months? We have three, four, seven, nine, sixteen. Read histograms. Size of on Prince Street. How many houses are on Prince Street? Oh shit, this is insane number of houses. It's, it's, it's a lot. Okay. So four, seven, eleven, nine, so we have twenty. Right? Four. 4 plus 7, it's going to be 11. Uh, plus 9, 20. Plus 4, 24. Plus 5 houses are on Queen Street. How many cherry pies have 60 to 89 cherries and 90 to 100? Oh, okay. The 90 tons. 4 and 10, it's gonna be 6, 6, 5. Mm, yep. Mass of each pumpkin, Leonard's batch, number of pumpkins. 
how many pumpkins have a mass greater than six? Greater than six. So I guess it's only right. Uh, nine. Wait, wait, what? Oh shit! I got it wrong. How many pumpkins have a mass greater than six? Is six. Uh, six. So this much. So we have eight and six fourteen. Pumpkins. How many pumpkins are in Leonard's patch? Numbers. Okay, so we have four. Uh, five. Uh, four. Five. That's nine. And then eight. We have seventeen. Uh, and then six. We have twenty-three. Uh, and then two and five. Oh. So frequency tables and dot plots. What I have here is the list of ages of the students in a class. And what I want to explore in this video is different ways of representing this data and then see if we can answer uh, questions about the data. So the first way we can think about it is as a frequency table. Frequency table. Frequency table. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at each, for each age, for each possible age that we've measured here, see how many students in the class are of that age. So we could say the age is one column, and then the number, the number of students of that age. Or we could even say the frequency. Frequency. When people so say, how frequent do you do something? They're saying, how often does it happen? How often do you do that thing? Frequency. Or we could also say, actually, let me just write number. Three, I'm always four, a fan of the simpler. Number at four, age, which nine, we could also consider one, the frequency four, at that age. Four, so one, frequency of students. All right. Ten, one, so what's the lowest five, age that we have here? Five, it's lowest well, the lowest five, age is five. So I'll start with five. And how many students in the class are age five? How one. frequent is the number five? One. Let's see. There is one, two. Let me keep scanning. Looks like there's only two fives. So I could write a two here. There are two fives. And now let's go to six. How many sixes are there? Let's see. There is one six. There's only one six-year-old in the class. All right, seven-year-olds. So really, see, there's one, wide range. two, three, wide, well, four seven-year-olds. Seven four seven-year-olds. Now, what about eight-year-olds? Eight-year-olds. I'm gonna do some color that I have not used yet. Eight-year-olds. We have no eight-year-olds. Zero eight-year-olds. And then we have nine-year-olds. Let's see. Nine-year-olds. We have one, two. Three, four, four nine year olds. Four nine year olds. Ten year olds. What do we have? We have one ten year old right over there. And then eleven year olds. Two of them. Eleven year olds. There are no eleven year olds. Oh shit. Eleven. And then let me scroll there up a little bit. And then finally twelve year olds. Twelve year olds. There are one, two twelve year olds. So what we have just constructed is a frequency table. It's a frequency table. You can see, you can see for each age how many students are at that age. So it's giving you the same information as we have up here. You could take this table and construct what we have up here. You would just write down two fives, one six, four sevens, no eights, four nines, one ten, no elevens, and two twelves. And then you would just have this list of numbers. Now a way to visually look at a frequency table you could, is a dot plot. So let me draw a dot plot right over here. So a a dot Holy plot. Shit, that's what I did. I and a dot a, plot, we essentially just take the same information and even think about it the same way. But we just show it visually. So in a dot plot, what we would have, in a dot plot, what we would have, uh, actually, I would, let me just not draw an even arrow there. We have the different age groups. So five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven and 12, 
And we have a dot to represent, or we, we use a dot for each student at that age. So there's two five-year-olds, so I'll do two dots. One and two. There's one six-year-old, so that's going to be one dot. Right over here. There's four seven-year-olds, so one, two, three, four dots. There's no eight-year-olds. There's four nine-year-olds, so one, two, three, and four. There's one ten-year-old, so let's put a dot, one dot right over there for that one ten-year-old. There's no eleven-year-old, so I'm not going to put any dots there. And then there's two twelve-year-olds. So one twelve-year-old and another twelve-year-old. So there you go. We have frequency table, dot plot, list of numbers. These are all showing the same data, just in different ways. And once you have it represented in any of these ways, we can start to ask questions about it. So we could say, what is the most frequent age? Well, the most frequent age, when you look at it visually, or, or the easiest thing might be just look at the dot plot, because you see it visually, the most frequent age are the, the two highest stacks. So there's actually seven and nine are, free, are, are tied for the most frequent age. You would have also seen it here, where seven and nine are tied at four. And if you just had this data, you would actually just, you'd have to count all of them to kind of come up with this again and say, okay, there's four sevens, four nines, that's the largest number. So this is, if you're looking for what's the most frequent age, when you just visually inspect here, it probably pops out at you the fastest. But there's other questions we can ask ourselves. We can ask ourselves, what is the range? What is the range of ages in the classroom? And this is Seven. once again where maybe the dot plot is the most, uh, it jumps out at you the most, because the range is just the maximum age in your, or minus the maximum the data point minus the minimum data point. So what's the maximum age here? Well, the maximum age here, we see it from, this, from the dot plot, is 12. And the minimum age here, you see, is 5. So there's a range of seven. The difference between the maximum and the minimum is seven. But you could have also done that over here. You could say, hey, the maximum age here is 12. Minimum age here is five. And so subtract from, tw from five. <laughs> you, say, you find the difference between 12 and five, which is seven. Here, you would have done have to do, you could still could have done it. You could say, okay, what's the lowest? Let's see, look at five. Are there any fours here? Nope, there's no fours. So five's the minimum age. And what's the largest? Is it seven? No. Is it nine? Nine? No. Ten? Oh, 12. 12. Are there any 13s? No. 12 is the maximum. So you say 12 minus 5 is 7 to get the range. But then we could ask ourselves other questions. We could say, how many, how many older, older than 9 is a question we could, we could ask ourselves. And then if we were to look at the dot plot, we say, okay, this is nine, and we care about how many are older than nine. So that would be this one, two, and three. Or you could look over here, how many are older than nine? Well, it's the one person who's 10, and then the two who are 12. So there are three. And over here, if you said how many are older than nine, well, then you would just have to go through the list and say, okay, no, 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 no. Okay, here, one, two, three, and then not that person right over there. So hopefully you, this is just a, an appreciation for yet another two ways of looking at data, frequency tables and dot plots. What I want to do in this video is look at some, hello, hello, hello. some examples of data represented in different ways and think about which representation is the best or can help us answer different questions. So we see this first example. A statistician recorded the length of each of Pixar's first 14 films. The statistician made a dot plot. Each dot is a film, a histogram, and a box plot to display the running time data. Which display could be used to find the median? To find the median. All right, so let's look at, look, let's, let's look at these displays. So over here we see the 14, this is the, this is the dot plot. We have a dot for each of the 14 films. So one film had a running time of 81 minutes. We see that there. One film had a running time of 92. One had a running time of 93. We see one had a running time of 95. We see two had running times of 96 minutes, and so on and so forth. 
So I claim that I could use this to figure out the median because I could make a list of all of the running times of the films. I could order them and then I could find the middle value. I could literally make a list. I could write down 81 and then write down 92, then write down 93, then write down 95, then I could write down 96 twice, and then I could write down 98, then I could write down 100. I see where you go. Where you see, I think you see where this is going. I could write out the entire list and then I could find the middle value. So the dot plot I could definitely use to find the median. Now what about the histogram? This is the histogram right over here. And, and the key here is for a median, to figure out a median, I just need to figure out a list of numbers. I need to figure out a list of numbers. So here, I don't know, you know, they say I have one film that's between 80 and 85, but I don't know its exact running time. It might, its running time might have been 81 minutes. Its running time might have been 84 minutes. So I don't know here. And so I can't really make a list of the running times of the films and find the middle value. So I don't think I'm going to be able to do it using the histogram. Now, with the, with the box plot right over here, so I'm not going to click histogram. With the box plot over here, I might not be able to make a list of all the values, but the box plot explicitly tells us what the median is. This middle line in the, in the middle of the box that tells us the median is, what is this? This median is, if this is 100, this is 99. So this is 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. It explicitly tells us the median is 99. This is actually the easiest for calculating the median. So I'll go with the box plot. So the histogram is of no use to me if I want to calculate the median. Let's do a couple more of these. Nam owns a used car lot. He checked the odometers of the cars and recorded how far they had driven. He then created both a histogram and a box plot to display the same data. Both diagrams are shown below. Which display can be used to find how many vehicles had driven more than 200,000 kilometers? So how many c vehicles had driven more than 200,000 kilometers? Yep. So it looks like here in this, in this histogram, three, I have and three and vehicles five. that were between 200 and 250, and then I have two vehicles that are between 250 and 300. So it looks pretty clear that I have five vehicles, three that were, had a mileage between 200,000 and 250,000, and then I had two that had mileage between 250,000 and 300,000. So I'm able to answer the question. Five vehicles had a mileage more than 200,000. And so I would say that the histogram is pretty useful. But let's verify that the box plot isn't so useful. So I want to know how many vehicles had a mileage more than 200,000. Well, I know, I know that if I have a mileage more than 200,000, I'm going to be in the fourth, I'm going to be in the fourth quartile, but I don't know how many values I have sitting there in the fourth quartile just looking at this data over here. So, I'm not that's not going to be useful for answering that question. Let's look at the second question. Which display can be used to find the median distance? Which display can be used to find that the median distance was approximately 140,000 kilometers? Well, to calculate the median, you essentially want to be able to list all of the numbers and then find the middle number. And over here, I can't list all of the numbers. I know that there's three values that are between 0 and 50,000 kilometers, but I don't know what they are. It could be 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. It could be 10,000, 15,000, and 40,000. I don't know what they are. And so if I, can't, if I can't list all of these things and put them in order, I really am going to have trouble finding the middle value. The middle value is going to be it's going to be in this, in this range right around here, but I don't know exactly what it's going to be. The histogram is not useful because it's throwing all the values into these buckets. While on the box plot, it explicitly, it directly tells me the median value. This line right over here, the middle of the box, this tells us the, medi the median value. And it's, we see that the median value here, this is 140,000 kilometers. Right? This is 100, 110. 120, 130, 140,000 kilometers is the median mileage for the cars. And so the box plot clearly, clearly gives us, clearly gives us that data. Thrill Soda hired a marketing company to help them promote their brand against Yummy Cola. The company gathered the following data about consumers' preference of soda. 
So they have year by year, percentage of respondents who preferred yummy cola, percentage of respondents who perform who prefer thrill cola, and then these are people who had no preference. So in 2006, 80% liked yummy, only 12% liked thrill, and 8% didn't like either one or didn't have any preference. And so actually, just from here, you see that many, many more people liked Yummy Cola than Thrill Cola, actually, every year over here. So Thrill Cola definitely has something. They have an uphill battle. But then they said the advertising company created the following two graphs to promote Thrill Soda. And so let's see what's happening over here. So And, and let's think about whether this is misleading or not. So if we look at this graph over here, in 2006, sure enough, 80% liked Yummy Cola, then 2007. 76%, then it keeps going, to, then 77%, then 73%, then 73 to 68 So this is actually accurate data. It actually represents the data that's given, that's given right over here. I'll do it in the same. It actually represents this data very faithfully. Then right over here, if we look at this chart, yeah, percentage of people who prefer well. Thrill Soda. So over here in 2006, 12% prefer twil Thrill Soda. 2006, 12%. 2007, 19%. 2008, 19%, then we go up to 20, 21, and 25. So the graphs are actually accurate. They're not lying. These are actually the data points of the percentage who prefer Thrill Soda. Now what's misleading is if someone were to just look at these two graphs without actually looking at the scales over here, they'll see two things. They'll say, oh look, you see a declining trend, and that's what line graphs are good for, for seeing trends. They say, look, I see a declining trend in the number of in the percentage of people who prefer yummy cola. And I see this increasing trend in the percentage of people who prefer thrill cola. And that's true. You have a declining trend here, and you have an increasing trend here. But what's misleading here is the way that they've plotted the scales. These scales are not the same. So when you look at this, you say not only is there an increasing trend of people who prefer thrill soda but it, the way they set up the scale that it looks like the trend is above it looks like if you look you, you're the human brain is tempted to compare these and they say look not only is this an upward trend but it's above this trend right over here even in 2006 this data point looks higher than than these data points right over here but the reality is is that it's only because the scale is distorted and this is the oldest trick in the book when plotting line graphs it all depends on the scale so this just looks good because they they used this scale that went from 0 to 30 as opposed to 0 to 100. The more, uh, the better thing to do, or the more genuine thing to do, or the more honest thing to do would have actually been to plot them on the same graph. Although if they did that, that wouldn't have painted a very good picture for Thrill Soda. So if we plotted it on the same graph, Thrill Soda, let's try that out. So in 2006, 12, and actually this is even worse. You could, actually wouldn't even be able to plot Thrill Soda on this graph, because they started this graph right over here at 50%. They didn't even start it at 0%. So you actually would not even be able to plot Thrill Soda on this graph. If you did, you would have to extend this graph all the way down. So you would have to extend this graph all the way down to, you know, so this would have to be 40, this would be 30, you this would be 20%, this would be 10%, and then or down all the way over here would be 0%, and then the thrill soda graph would be all the way down here. So it was like 12%, and it goes all the way up to like 25%. So the thrill soda, so it would have looked something like this. The graph would have looked something like this, which is nowhere near. If you ha if you plotted these on the same thing on the same scale on the same graph, then it would have still been pretty obvious that a lot more people, even though the trend is downward, a lot more people prefer prefer yummy cola th to to thrill cola. So there's two we'll very that. disingenuous things going on over here. One is the actual scale. For this amount of distance on this scale, they represent 10%. So whatever the gain is, it looks like it's a huge gain. And over here, that same amount, they're actually representing a larger amount. They're representing closer to 15 or 16%. And then the main thing is they started the scale here at 50%. So they're not showing how many people really prefer, how, how large 80% or even 70% really is. And over here, they start at 0, and they just have a larger scale. So it makes it look like. Out the gate, a lot of people prefer, or a comparable amount of people prefer Thrill, and that the trend is up. But the reality is still way more people prefer Yummy Cola. So this was a little bit, uh, or actually very, very not so honest way of representing the data. Or I guess you'd say they're misrepresenting the data.
There's four matches. Wait, what? Four matches, right? It's not open. Well, I okay. What? Now it's ten. Mass of each pumpkin is patched in near stand per kilogram. Then you create both a histogram and box plot to display the same data. Which you play which is going to be used to find how many pumpkins had masses below kilograms. Masses below six. Oh we can use the histogram. The median the box plot obviously. Uh, Re Regina is a re realtor. What the hell is that? And studies house prices. She recorded the area of each house on Spring Street. She then created two histograms to display the data. A histogram A shows the data using a bin width of 50, and histogram B shows the same data using a bin width of 100. Which histogram can be shown to find? How many houses have areas greater than 200 square meters? Okay, both A and B. Is that it? Do you measure the daily high temperature in Casco? She then created a dot plot and a box plot in the same area. Which display makes it easier to see that the third square tile is. Which data can be used to find how many days at a high temperature below 8? Okay, I guess the dot plot, but I'm not sure. I use the box plot for the second one. See that the third quartile is 14. Um, okay. Uh, Leo owns a hostel and counted the number of guests staying in each room. He then created both histogram and dot plot. Which is playing in to find that. There were two rooms without guests. Uh, two rooms without guests. Cluster and gaps in the data. Oh shit, what? Can be used to find that there were two rooms. Two rooms. But guess it's gonna be the dot plot. Which should make these see clusters and gaps in the data. I think the dot plot as well. What the fuck? But I'm pretty sure it wants me to answer this to them. Easier to, to see clusters and gaps. Here four. Oh my god, this is hard. I mean both can do that. I don't know. Fuck you, man. Fuck you so much. No, I remember this one A and B, right? Oh, what the fuck? There's still one for. Oh my god. So I counted the number of songs in each on each album in this collection to create both a dot plot and a box plot and display the same data. Um box plot. 
dot plot not happy which display can be used to find the maximum number of guests in a room the dot plot Both dot plot, right? Oh my god. Which is play make it clear that there were no rooms with I mean, the dot plot shows it as well. God, it's I mean the graph of the kinds of writing of all the pages she has used so far. Um, how many pages are left in Mari's notebook? One, two, five, uh, eleven, uh, fourteen, nineteen, uh, How many more pumpkins have a mass within 9, 12, then 0, to 3, 2 pumpkins? 
the graph shows the number of hurricanes that occurred over four months. The number of hurricanes in September is the number of hurricanes in June, June, July, August combined. Four, three, seven. Ali owns anything Ali owns, yeah. Which is playing be to find the ma maximum number of guests in the dot plot. Dot plot as well. Oh my god, I fucking hate this question. Well, I'm almost done. Let's say that today, and we'll call today day one. Day one is a Monday. What I want to figure out is what is day 300 going to be? Day 300. What day of the week will day 300 be? And I encourage you to pause this video and think wow. about that a little bit. So let's just write out the days of the week. You have Monday. This is a different color. You have Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So if we had a lower number here, we could just fill out this fill out fill this out. Monday is day one, Tuesday is day two, Wednesday day three, four, five, six, seven. I'll keep going. Day eight. Well that's gonna be a Monday again. Nine, ten. I'm almost writing a calendar out. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16. So this is kind of useful. I could just write it out if I wanted to figure out something, you know, day 16 or day 20. I, I could just Saturday. write that out. But this isn't that helpful if I wanted to figure out day 300, or it especially Saturday, would right. be helpful if I wanted to figure out day 3000. So can I come up with some mathematical way of thinking about what day 300 is going to be? It's going to be the remainder. Well, when I, as you see, when I started drawing this grid here, this grid has rows, and in each row you have seven days in it. And that makes sense. There's seven days of the week. So is there a way that if someone just gave you 16 without drawing this grid, that you would know that 16 is a Tuesday? Well, one way to think about it that might jump out at you is you could divide 16 by 7. That will tell you how many of these rows will come before 16. That will tell you how many rows come before 16. So 16 divided by 7 is 2. You have two rows before 16 right over here. You could get 7 into 16 two times, and then you have a remainder. And then you have a remainder. What is the remainder when you divide 16 by 7? 16 divided by 7 well, is going to be 2. 2 times 7 is 14. You're going to have a remainder of 2. So when we divide, we, we've, we've historically cared more about this 2 We've used, we normally care more about, well, how many times does it go into it? But now the remainder is actually interesting. The remainder is really interesting here. Because the remainder tells you 
the, the first two just tells you, well, seven goes into 16 two times. That's how many rows you have before getting to the 16. But then the remainder tells you, well, in that row, where is the 16? So the 16 is remainder two. So the 16 is not the first. It's the second entry in the third row. And so it's going to be a Tuesday. Tuesday is the second day. I know what you're saying. Does that always work? Well, let's try it out with some, some other examples. Let's imagine day 25. Day 25. So let's just divide 25 I'm by 7. For Friday. So I'll do it's it right Friday. over. I could do it. Let me I'll make sure I have enough space. So if I have 7 goes into 25, it goes 3 times. 3 times 7 is 21. You have a remainder of 4. So let's see. So based on that, so let me rewrite this. So 25 divided by 7 is equal to 3 remainder 4. So it's equal to 3 remainder 4. So based on this, if we were to write out the grid, we should have three rows of 7 before we get to the 25. And then 25 should sit into the, in the fourth column. So if it's sitting in the fourth column, it should be a Thursday. So day, 35, day 25, based on this little math we just did, should be a Thursday. Let's see if that actually works out. So let's go to 17. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. It is indeed a Thursday, but it makes complete sense. You could get seven rows in it before the row that gets to 25. And then in that row, it's going to be the fourth entry because you have a remainder of four. One, two, three, four. It's going to be a Thursday. So now we're ready to answer the question, what is day 300 going to be? So let's just divide 300. Let's just divide 300 by 7 and see where we get. 7 goes into 30 four times. 4 times, four times 7 is 28. Subtract, you get 2. Bring down a 0. 7 goes into 20 two times. 2 times 7 is 14. And then we get our remainder. And now we care much more about the remainder. 20, 20 minus 14 is 6. So our remainder is 6. So if we think about what day of the week it is, in the, its row, it's going to be the sixth Saturday. entry. It's going to be the Did sixth column. Friday? It's I going to be 42 rows above it. But we care about which entry it is in its row. So day 300 is going to be the sixth day of the week, the way we've written it out. It is going to be, it is going to be a Saturday. Cool, cool, cool. I want to make little townhouse shapes with toothpicks. So this would be my first townhouse. I've used three toothpicks so far, four, five, and six. Toothpicks. So that is my first townhouse. And let me make a little table here, keeping track of things. So I'll do that in white. So here's my table to keep track of things. So this is the number of houses, number of houses. And then this is the toothpicks toothpicks that I'm using to make that house. So this first toothpick, or this, the first house here, took me six toothpicks. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now let's make our second house. Our second house. And these are going to be townhouses. They're going to share common walls. So I'm going to add one, two, three, four, five toothpicks for my second house. Now why did I only have to add five and not six? Well, they shared a common wall here, so I didn't have to add another toothpick here for this left-hand side wall. Okay. So starting with the first house, I really just had to add five toothpicks. 11, then I had 16, to add five toothpicks to get to now 11 total toothpicks if I want two houses. I think you see the pet trend here. What about three? What about three of these? Well, this is going to be another five. One, two, three, four, five toothpicks. So we're going to add five again. I'm going to add 5 again and get to 16. Let's do 4 just for good measure. So the fourth one, we're going to add another 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the fourth one, we're going to add another 5. Gets us to, gets us to 21. Now, I want to think about, can we, using this pattern, figure out how many, it would, how many toothpicks it would take for us to say, make 50 of these townhouses, or even 500 of these townhouses, or even 5,000 of them. And we just have to look at this pattern here and see, can we come up with an equation for each of these actual values? So for example, we see a pattern that 
We, well, we already recognize uh, that we're, so we, we started with six, and we're adding five uh, every whatever. time. Add, every time we add a house. So since you so when you add the second house, you add five once. The third house, you add five, you, you start with six and you add five twice. The fourth house, you start with six and you add five three times. So let's actually write that down. So 21 is equal to you start with six, you start with this six here, you start with six, and then you add five three times, plus five times three. When you had the three houses, once again, you started with six, you started with six, and you added five two times. You added five, let me do that five same color. Times and you added five plus two times. One. Plus five times two. When you had when you had two houses, you started with six again. This is equal to six, and you added five once. So plus five it's per shit way. Plus five times one. And then when you had one house, when you, one ha when you had one house, and it'll fit the same pattern, you six started with six, and how many times zero. did you add five? Well, you didn't add five. You could say that you added five, you added five zero times. So you might see a little pattern here. However many houses you needed, you take one less than that, multiply it by five, add that to six, and you get the number of toothpicks. And I, actually, let me rewrite this. So I could rewrite this as six plus five, times four minus one. I could write this as six plus five times three minus one. I think five times you could write this as plus six plus five times two minus one. You could rewrite this as six plus five times one minus one. And maybe that makes the pattern a little bit closer and or clearer. This four is right over here. This three is right over here. This two this two is right over here, and then this one is right over here. So now I think we are ready to think about what would happen if we wanted to make 50 houses. So let's try to do that. So this right over here is you know, like orange. This right over here is our 50th house. So this is, this, this is the shared left wall it has. This is the 50th house right over here. So how many total toothpicks for 50 houses? So if we have 50 houses, well, we can use the pattern that we came up with. It's going to be equal to, so it's going to be equal to starting with our six. The first house requires six. And then we're going to add five for each incremental house. So plus five for each incremental house. And how many incremental houses are there going to be? Well, they're going to be 50 minus one incremental houses. Why minus one? Well, you already built one of them with the six. Then for every extra one, so there's going to be 49 extra houses, you're going to add five toothpicks apiece. So this is going to be equal to six plus five times 49, and that is 245. So six plus 245, six plus 245 is equal to 251 sticks. And what's really neat about this pattern we just came up with is you could use it to figure out how many, how many sticks you would need for a million of these little toothpick townhouses. I want to make little townhouse. So let's say I have tables where I can fit one person at either of the short ends of the table. So I could fit one person there, I could fit one person there. You could view this as we're looking, da we're looking from above the table here. So we could put one person at either of the short ends of the table. And then on these longer ends right over here, we can fit two people. We can fit two people at the longer end. So when you have one table, so when you have one table, you could fit one, two, three, four, five, six people you could fit six people. Now let's think about what happens as we add tables end to end to this table right over here. So let's imagine now two tables. So here we have. Okay. 
one table, and it's going to touch ends with this table right over here. And because it touches ends right over here, we're kind of making it one big continuous table, you can't fit someone here anymore. So now how many people can we fit? Let's see, we can fit one, two, three, four, five. And then on this table, which is identical, you could fit then, so it's gonna six, be seven, eight, tables, nine. And then you could put one person at the end table, right over here. Plus two. So when you have two tables, you can now fit end to end, you can now fit a total of 10 people. Let's keep going and see if we can think of a pattern here. So let's put three tables here. So one table, uh, two six, tables, uh, 14 people and three there. tables. So just as before, we could put one at each end. So that's two people. Then we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen folks. Fourteen folks. So what does it look like is happening here? Well, if you just look at the numbers, we went from six to ten to fourteen. It looks like we're adding. It looks like we're adding four people every time we actually add a table. Now, does that actually make sense? So let's think about this first situation. Let's imagine these are real people, and I'll make this person in blue right over here. If you were to bring over this new table, if you bring over table two, so this is table one, if you bring over table two, this blue person has to move. And so where could they move? Let's say that they always insist on sitting at the end of a table. So the blue person moves to the new end of the table. The new end of the table. They move right over here. So how many new people could move to this combined table now that you brought the second table in? Well, the new people, the new people I will do in, I will do in this purple color. The new people are that person. Let me do it in a more unique color. This person, this person, this person, and this person. So you were able to add four new people with a new table. One way to think about it is, a new table is going to have one usable end here. That usable end is going to be taken by the person who was already at the usable end of when you had less tables. And so you're really able to, the real addition is the two sides here. So you're adding four people every time you add a table. So it makes complete sense. So based on this, you could think about, without even having to draw these diagrams, what would happen or how many people you would be able to fit if you had four or five or six or however many tables. So you can imagine, if you, have, if you have four tables, we just have to add four, and you should be able to sit 18 people. If you have five tables, you should be able to fit 22 people, and on and on and on. One color versions. Use the colors in the following order. And then starts over from the beginning. What color painting is uh, uh what color paint is fifty one? Okay. One, two, three, four, five. This can be red. The following patterns are seven in the list in the list the first ten multiples of seven. Oh, it's in the five, it's in the sixty-five. Oh, it's multiplied by four. Okay, cool. New test. Let's go. The table below shows the number of runs scored by different. Which guy below shows the most reasonable scale for the information. Okay, so we have Braves. Uh, we get name besides and we get scores. Here we have a range of from 8 to 20. Okay. Uh, how many hostel rooms have 11 or fewer against us? 
guest in each of number of horse goblins. Oh shit, this is hard. Like eight, then uh, eight, five, thirteen, sixteen. The following dot dot shows the number of songs on each album in Sal's collection. Each album is different album. How many albums are, are in Sal's collection? Oh shit, that's a lot. Uh, five, five, nine, ten, fifteen, seventeen, right? Five, ten, fifteen, seventeen. Leonard measured the mass of each pumpkin in his patch to the nearest ten kilogram. Oh fuck, I hate this one. Which should play in to find how many pumpkins and masses had below? Six. Oh, I guess the mass one would work. Yep. Uh, medium. Okay. Let's just be sure for the first one. Below six. This is below six. This guy's. Okay. The graph shows the number of students who play various instruments. The marching band play flute, then drums, drums and trombone combine. The drums is 32 plus trombone 16 is 48. And then the difference for that is 8. 8 pure students. Dorothy gives a ribbon to each of her friends in the following order and then starts over from the beginning. Who gets the 18th ribbon? The beginning, the scarecrow, tin man, coward, and Toto. Wait, what? The ribbon to each of her friends in the following order. Who gets the 18th ribbon? It's total, right? No, no, not really. I mean, no, no, no. It's actually a uh, tin man. Because we have like 18 divided by 4. And there are 4 here. So it's 16 left, left over. And the second one is tin man. The government published the following stem in the loop plot journal. How many zoos have fewer than 18 slots? Okay, let's see. This is oh shit, one, two, three, four. There's four zoos in stock. Uh 18 slots. Okay, four of them. Uh, some students have there in school signed a petition asking for a reading area for recess. The uh, the graph below shows the number of signatures from each grade. How many total signatures are on petition? Oh, okay, it's gonna add some credit. We have five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, twenty, fourteen, I guess. Let's see again. Five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 20, 40. Uh, volume of water her Hurley drank each day. Wow, it's a lot for each day. 4 liters per cup. For how many days did Hurley measure the volume of water that he drank? For, uh, wait, what? Number of days, 10 days, right? That's a bit confusing. How many days did Hurley measure the volume? Ten days, right? What the fuck? How many how many days did Hurley measure the volume of water? Uh, 
Am I supposed to say eight is the maximum? But oh my god, it's not even eight, dude. Oh my fucking god. How many days did Hurley measure the volume? Oh shit. Ah oh, fuck. I think I'm supposed to add all this. Oh, fuck. Four, five, nine, uh, sixteen, twenty, twenty seven, thirty days. What? Let's see. We have four and five, it's nine. Eight to eight, we have sixteen. Sixteen plus nine. Uh two and five. Uh third one. Oh my god. Oh shit, oh a lot. Okay. No level down. No level down. Okay. Bailey Berg could not help himself in reaching right into the beehive to get some honey. Now he has bee sting. Okay, to grab some bee stings he has in each leg. Okay, right arm, then right legs, to left arm, eight, and left legs, four. living room to bedroom few boxes uh, after which room has the same number of boxes okay this is 9 uh, this is 45 no oh, shit oh, 45 is actual 15 3 times 3 3 times 5 3 times 4 12 and bathroom is 3 boxes so from living room the, ba the bedroom, your boxes, so it's 6 now here and 15 here. Right, so we have kitchen and bedroom. Kitchen and bedroom. And bed bedroom, right, okay. Uh, country is presented at each festival. How many festivals had 18 to 20 countries presented? Number of festivals, 100. How many festivals had 18? 23 countries represented okay eight to 18 to 23 it's four and zero to five just one three right I'm gonna fuck myself if this is incorrect okay cool the following frequency there was just a number of eight it's each student in Mizat's class received what was the minimum number of A's that a student received uh, two. Oh shit, no. What is the minimum number of A's? Zero. Oh, yeah. Which display can be used to find how many vehicles are driven more than the histogram? Which design can be used to find the median, the box plot median? Five students in the school's puzzle club had a contest to see who could find the most words in a word search puzzle containing 500 words. And not any anywhere in the puzzle the student did not find was missed. Wait, what? Containing 50 words. Which student missed exactly 10 words in the puzzle? So, it's Gabe. A statistician for a chain department store secured the following number of pair of glasses. What is the largest number of pair of glasses at one department store? Forty-seven. The following pattern starts with four and use the rule 
add 6 to the previous term 4, 10, 16, and 18. Do the following same is true. Every other number in the pattern is odd. No. Every number in the pattern is again. What? One answer only, right? Number of squirrels participating in these different dance classes. How many more squirrels are in tap and ballet combined in, in hip hop? So we have tap and ballet. So uh, this is 7 times 5, we have 35. And this guy, right? And then for hip hop, 1, 2, oh, 35. Wow. 0. Oh my gosh. How many scores are in tap and ball combined than hip hop? Zero scores are the same. Oh shit, no, not really. Uh, five, it's 25, so it's 10. What am I saying zero? What the fuck? Woo. Cool. How long am I recording? Exactly to wash up. Okay. I guess that I mastered it part. Alright, points only. Could have made it much more faster. Uh, 51, and now it's a 55. Uh, okay. For some algebra. Hmm. Should I try measurement now or should I do it tomorrow? Okay, I feel like doing this tomorrow. Because there's a lot of videos. Hmm, I don't want to do it now though. Maybe I should just give it a, a start. Hmm. Yeah, let's just do it. So we've got two figures right over here and I want to think about how much space they take up on your screen. And this idea of how much space something takes up on a surface, this idea is area. So right when you look at it, it looks pretty clear that this purple figure takes up more space on my screen than this blue figure. But how do we actually measure it? I'm just going to make coffee. Right, I'm back, I'm back. Measure it. How do we actually know how much more area this purple figure takes up than this blue one? Well, one way to do it would be to define a unit amount of area. So for example, I could create a square right over here. And this square, whatever units we're using, we could say it's a one unit. So if it's width right over here is one unit. And its height right over here is one unit. We could call this a unit square. A unit square. And so one way to measure the area of these figures is to figure out how many unit squares I could cover this thing with without overlapping and while staying in the boundaries. Five. So let's try to do that. Let's try to cover each of these with unit squares and then and essentially we'll have a measure of area. So I'll start with this blue one. So we could put one, two, three, three, four, five, five unit squares. Let me write this down. So we got one, two, three, four, five unit squares. And I could draw the boundary between those unit squares a little bit clearer. So we have five unit squares. And so we could say that this figure right over here has an area. The area is five. We could say five unit squares. The more typical way of saying it is that you have five square, five square units. That's the area over here. Now let's do the same thing with this purple figure. So with the purple figure, I could put one, two, Three, four, six, eight, ten, five, or eleven, I don't know. six, oh, seven, eight, 
9, 10 of these unit squares. I can cover it. They're not overlapping. Or I'm trying pretty close to not make them overlap. You see you can fit 10 of them. And let me draw the, the boundary between them. So you can make them a little, you can see it a little bit clearer. So that's the boundary between my unit squares. Between my unit squares. So I think there you go. And we can count them. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we could say the area here, and let me actually divide these with the black boundary too. It makes it a little bit clearer than that blue. So the area here for the purple figure, we could say, so the area here is equal to 10, 10 square, 10 square units. So what we have here, we have an idea of how much space does something take up on a surface. And you could eyeball it, say, hey, this takes up more space. But now we've come up with a way of measuring it. We can define a unit square. Here it's a one unit by one unit. In the future, we'll see that it could be a, it could be a unit centimeter. It could be a one centimeter by one centimeter square. It could be a one meter by one meter square. It could be a one foot by one foot square. But then we can use that to actually measure the area of things. This thing has an area of five square units. This thing has an area of 10 square units. So this one, we can actually say, is twi has twice the area. The purple figure had twice the area. It's 10 square units as the blue figure. It takes up twice the amount of space on the screen. I have two identical rectangles here, and I want to measure how much each of them, how much space each of them take up on the plane of my screen, the screen that you are looking at right now. And I want to do it using two different units. It's clear since they're two identical rectangles that they take up the exact same amount of space. They will have the same area. But what we can see is that we can measure that area using different units. So first over here, let's say that this, this figure is one foot in width. So let's say it is one foot in width. So that is one foot in width. And it is also one foot in height. One foot in height. So this right over here is equal to one square, one square foot. It's clearly a square. It has the same width and the same height. And each of these dimensions are one foot. So we could call it one square foot. So let's see how many square feet we can get onto one of these rectangles. And it's essentially, we'll be measuring its area in terms of square feet. And so we want to cover the entire space without overlapping and without going over the boundary. So that's one, two, three, three, four, five, five, and six. Six in that first row, and then I have seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. So that looks like this area, which is the same as this area down here, if I were to measure it in square feet, it is equal to, the area is equal to, let me write this down, the area is equal to, we have, let me write it down. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve square feet. Twelve square, twelve square feet. Now, I'm going to try to measure that same area in a different unit. And I'm going to just make up this unit. I'm going to call it a Fergal. And a Fergal in one dimension. So a Fergal in one dimension is twice a foot. So this right, that distance right over here, I'm going to call a Fergal. That's one Fergal. This is something that I made up just for the purpose of this video. Most people will not recognize what a Fergal is. So its height is one Fergal. Its width is a Fergal. And so we could say that this is one square, one square Fergal. One square Fergal. So let's see how many square fergals this uh, is this area, that same area that is 12 square feet. So let me copy and paste this. So let me copy and then paste. So let's see, we can get one square fergal on there. We can get another square fergal on there. And we can get a third square fergal on there. 
So we get one, two, three square Fergals. The area of this figure in Fergals, square Fergals, I should say, area is equal to three square, square Fergals. Three square Fergals. So it's the same exact area. Three square Fergals is equal to 12 square feet, covering the exact same area. Now what I encourage you to think about is, how many square feet make a square Fergal? square feet. Ah, oh, no, actually four square feet. Each square in the grid is a unit square with oh, an area insane. of one square centimeter. So each of these squares is one square centimeter. This is one square centimeter and this is one square centimeter and so on. And now we're asked what is the area of the figure. By figure, I'm sure they mean this bluish purplish quadrilateral, and we want to know its area. And area is talking about how much space the shape covers. How much space does this quadrilateral cover? How many square centimeters does the quadrilateral cover? To figure it out, we could start by counting. Here's one. Here's one square centimeter one, the quadrilateral three, four, covers. Five, six, seven, and I can keep counting eight, like that, nine, all of the square centimeters that I can see. Ten, Here's two, no, three. Twelve. Another row's got some here. Four, five, six. Down here, here's seven. Eight, nine. So there's nine full square centimeters. Nine square centimeters. But that's not the entire area. That's not everything it covers. It also covers these small parts, these triangle shaped uh, little spaces of area. And so we need to count those too. Let's look over here. Let's look. If we drew one of these triangles into a unit square, and then we drew another one on the other part, half of this unit square, we would see that combined, they make one full unit square. So we can do that. We can take this triangle up here, which is half of a unit square, and combine it with this half of a unit square. So if we combine these two together, that's one more unit square. So now we have nine full unit squares plus one more. But there's still more of them, so we can keep combining. This half unit square combined with the other one on the bottom makes a second unit square. 9-11. And finally, there's two more halves here. One, two, which oh, combine no. to make another whole. So we have nine full unit squares plus, three. plus three more unit squares that we made by combining. We made one by combining these two, a second unit square with these two, and a third unit square here. So we have nine full unit squares and then three more unit squares we put together, which is a total of 12 square units, or 12 square, in this case our unit is centimeters, 12 square centimeters. Our figure, our quadrilateral, covers 12 square centimeters, so it has an area of 12 square centimeters. Centimeters, so it has an area. The covers 12 square centimeters. Our figure, our quadrilateral, covers 12 square centimeters, so it has an area of 12 square centimeters. I've got three rectangles here, and I also have their, their dimensions. I have their height and their width. And in fact, this one right here has the same height and width, so this is actually a square. So let's think about how much space they each take up on my screen. And since we're doing everything in terms of meters, since all of the dimensions are in meters, I'm going to measure the area in terms of square meters. So let's see how many square meters I can fit onto this yellow rectangle without going outside of its boundary and without overlapping. 
So I can fit one square meter. Remember, a square meter is just a square where its length is one meter and its width is one meter. So that's one square meter, two, three, four, four, five, five, and six square meters. So we see here that the area, that the area is six square meters. Area is equal to six square square meters. But something might be jumping out at you. Did I really have to sit and count one, two, three, four, five, six? You might have recognized that I could view this as really two groups of three. Let me make that very clear. So for example, I could view this as one group of three, one group of three, and then another group of three. Now, how did I get groups of three? Well, that's because the width here is three meters. So I could put three, I could put three square meters side by side. And how did I get the two groups? Well, it's two meters. This has a length of two meters. So another way that I could have essentially counted the, these six things is I could have said, look, I have a length of two meters, so I'm going to have two groups of three. I'm going to have two groups of three. So I could multiply two times three, two times three, two times two of my groups of three, and I would have gotten six. And I would have gotten six. So I could, and you might say, hey, wait, is this just a coincidence that if I took the, the height or if I took the length and I multiplied it by the width, that I get the same thing as its area? And no, it's not. Because when you took the, the length, you essentially said, well, how many rows do I have? And then you say, when you multiply it by the width, you're saying, well, how many squares do I, or how many of these, how many of these square meters can I fit into a row? So this is a, a, really a quick way of counting how many of these square meters you have. So you could say that two meters multiplied by three meters, multiplied by three meters, is equal to six square meters. Is equal to six square, square meters. Now you might say, hey, I'm not sure if that always applies. Let's see if it applies to these other rectangles right over here. So based on what we just saw, let's take the length, four meters. Let's take the length. Let's see if it applies to these other rectangles right over here. So based on what we just saw, let's take the length, four meters. Let's take the length, four meters, and multiply by the width, and multiply by two meters. 2 meters. Now 4 times 2 is 8. So this should give us 8 square 8 square meters. Let's see if this is actually the case. So 1 2 3 4 5 and you see it's going in the right direction. 5 6 7 seven, and eight. So the area of this rectangle is indeed eight square meters. And you could view this as four groups of two. So you could literally view this as four groups of two. That's where the four times two comes from. So you could view it as four groups of two, like this. Or you could view it as two groups of four. So one group of four, right over here. So you could view this as two times four. And then two groups, two groups of four. I want to draw it a little bit cleaner. Now, you could probably figure out what the area of this no. rectangle is actually a square because it has the same length and the same width. We multiply the length a square because it has the same. Now, you could probably figure out what the area of this rectangle is actually a square because it has the same length and the same width. Yo, we multiply the length, right. three meters, times the width, so times three meters, to get three times three is nine. Nine square, nine square meters. Nine square meters. And let's verify it again, just to feel really good about this multiplying the dimensions of these rectangles. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 
nine. So it matches up. We figure out how many square meters can we, can we cover this thing with without overlapping, without going to the boundaries. We get the exact same thing as if we multiplied three times three. If we multiplied the length times the width in meters. And we're done. Draw a rectangle with the same area, but with no side lengths the same as those of the given rectangle. So here is our given rectangle, and we want to draw a rectangle with the same area. The same area. So what is the area of this rectangle? Area is the amount of space a shape so covers. So one by eight, so we can do so two by four. So how much space, or how many square units, does this shape cover? Does our rectangle cover? Each of these is one square unit, so our rectangle covers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight square units. It has an area of eight square units. So we want to draw another rectangle that also covers eight square units. If it covers eight square units, then it has an area of eight square units. But we can't just draw the identical rectangle because we're also told that it should have, our rectangle should have no side lengths the same. So what are the side lengths of our rectangle? Over here on the left, it's one unit long. And going across the top is eight units long. This rectangle had eight square units and they were broken up into one row of eight. So we need to think of another way that we can break up eight square units. One idea would be two rows of four, because two rows of four would also cover eight. So let's try that. Let's create a rectangle here. Two rows of four. And we can just spread this out a little bit so it covers the whole square units. And so this rectangle also covers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight square units. So the given rectangle and our rectangle have the same area because they cover the same amount of space. But they have different side lengths because our new rectangle is has a side length of two over here on the side it's two units long and going across the top is four units long so it has new side lengths so here's one way that we could draw a rectangle with the same area but different side lengths i'm going to do the for um, uh do a practice and first first and then i'm done yeah. Each small square on the grid has an area of one square unit. So each of these small squares is one square unit. This square is one square unit, and this square is one square unit, and so on. And now we're asked to draw a rectangle with an area of 10 square units. Well, this word area here is talking about how much space our shape covers. So our shape in this case is a rectangle. So we're being asked to draw a rectangle that covers 10 square units. And we know that each of these is one square unit. So we want a rectangle that covers 10 of the square units. We could try just drawing a rectangle right across this top row until we get 10 square units. But the problem there is there's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven square units going across the top. So we can't just do one long row of 10 square units. We can't do one long column either because one, two, three, four, five, six, only six square units. So we can't draw a rectangle going down like that either five because two. we need 10 square units. So that means we're gonna have to break up our 10 into equal groups. Since it can't all fit on one row, we're gonna to have to break up the unit squares into groups. So we can break up a 10 into two groups of five, 
or five groups of two. Either one of those will work. So let's do that. Let's draw ourselves a rectangle. We'll start up here. Here's a rectangle. And let's see, that's five. We can space to make sure that covers the whole square unit. There we go. So here's our rectangle. And this rectangle covers one, two, three, four, five. There's the first row of five. And the second row of five has unit squares six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So here's one perfect answer, a rectangle that has two rows of five square units. And we could have drawn this rectangle anywhere on the grid. It doesn't matter, we could have drawn it down here with two rows of five, or right here with two rows of five. Any rectangle covering two rows of five has an area of 10 unit squares. Similarly, any rectangle covering five rows of two, let's look and see if we can try to show that. Here we go. Here's a rectangle. And this one will cover one, two. So we have rows of two, and there's five rows. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So again, this rectangle covers ten square units. So any rectangle that you can draw on the grid that either covers two rows of five square units or five rows of two square units is a rectangle with an area of 10 square units. Cool. This square is one square unit, so what is the area of rectangle A? The first thing we're told is that each of these little squares equal one square unit, and then we're asked to find the area of rectangle A. Here's rectangle A, and Sport area is the space that it covers. So how much space does rectangle A cover? How many square units does rectangle A cover? One way to answer that would be to count how many square units it covers, except they've covered up our square units. So one idea is we could draw them back. Say you cover them up, we'll draw them back in. So go in like this, connect all these, and then we should be able to count our square units. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve square units. Rectangle A covers twelve square units, so it has an area of twelve square units. But this isn't the only way that we could have solved this. We could have also said, we could have also looked at this and said, okay, this top row is four square units long. One, two, three, four. Has a length of four units. So that means the top row will have one, two, three, four square units inside of it. And then we could have looked over on the side over here and said, well, how many rows of four will there be? There'll be one, two, three rows of four. So we'll have this row of four, and then a second row of four, and a third. So three times we will have four square units. There's four square units at the top, another in the middle, and another at the bottom. Three times we will have four square units. Or, we could go even farther than that, so we could have said we could have done three times four, or we could look at this and say, okay, here's four, five, one three, column. Three, this column has three square units. It has a length of three. One, two, three. How many of these columns like this will there be? There'll be one, two, three because our length here up at the top is four. So this time, four times, we will see three square units. One, two, three, and we'll see that one, two, three, four times. So no matter which of these we solved, 
whether we counted the square units like in the beginning or we multiplied the side lengths, the three and the four, in every case we're gonna find that this equals 12 square units. The area of rectangle A is 12 square units because it covers 12 square units. Okay. Okay, cool. Let's go. Four, eight, twelve, four, ten. What's this? Eleven. Uh, twelve. Oh shit, what's this? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Find area with partial units first. Oh my gosh, this is hard. Okay, so this is six. Uh, this is gonna be a six, twelve, uh, six, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Um, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A uh, nine. A uh, nine plus nine plus twelve. Uh, it's twenty one. Plus twenty three. It's twenty three. Let's just think of it again. Uh, twelve plus nine twenty one. Uh, oh, four, five, six. Um, this is six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, what is this? This, this is uh, eight and sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nine. Fifteen square units, okay. So that's three by fifteen. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. One which should I have the area of eighteen square units? Okay. Choose all answers about okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, eighteen. So this is 16 and it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What is the area of the blue rectangle at the top grid? Move the corners of the, the same area but no different side lengths. Okay. There's 16, so we're gonna do by 8, I guess. Whoa, 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 what the heck? 4, 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Cool. Ah, uh, sixteen. Uh, yeah, five and five, I guess. How can I move that to the top? Can I move it? Just to be inside this. One, two, three, four, five. Ooh, two, three, four, five. Uh, which one shows up with one, two, three, four, five, five, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times eight, eight times seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, Four by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's real nine. Okay. Nine by four, thirty-six. 
and one two three four five one two three four five six seven five and seven or seven fives one two three four five six seven eight. Wow, we made a mistake. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh my god, it's not a multiplication. Two, seven, five, six. Fuck. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times three. Uh, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wait, one, two, three. 8, 9 times 5 or 5 nines. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, 6 times 8. God, I made a mistake. Again. Okay, 3 by 9. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten by three. Just one. Once one, two, three, four, five, six, and four, six times four, or four sixes. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Five times eight. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Do that. Understand? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five by seven. Five times seven or seven fives. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, eight times six. Four. Rep represent rectangle measurements. Uh, not perimeter. It's forty-nine units. One answer on the right. Yeah, cool. Um. Okay. The width of the rectangle is 6. So, wait, what? It's going to be 4, bitch. Not given. 4. Yo, it's not given. Perimeter. Oh my god. Fuck. 12. Oh my god, this is hard. It's 24 square units, right? So we have like 4 by 6. 12. 12. So 12 plus 8 is 20 only. Not given. This is weird. With the 6. And length is not given. Our air 24 and the perimeter is not given. Oh my, are you fucking kidding me? Fuck me. <laughs> the length of the rectangular garden is 5 meters long. The area of the garden width is ten times two. Um area right, yeah. Nine units wide and a perimeter of forty units. Wow, forty units. That's insane. Uh perimeter. Start a quiz. Am I even recording? I don't know. Shit, okay, cool, I'm recording.
What is what you need? Uh, okay, we got uh, 10, 13. No way. 8, 10. Oh shit. It's 15. 1, 2, 4, 8, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Oh god, I hate myself so much. Uh, the perimeter is 36. The width is 8. Not given. Not given. Not given. Five, six. Uh, fifty-four. Nine times also. No level down, please. No level down. Oh, fuck you for. I don't even get how that works. Fucking hell, bitch. Okay, so we go. We got twelve, fourteen, a nine, a six, eight, ten. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11 I hate this shit A 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 uh, 8 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Hate it. 1, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, what is this? 4. 8, 9, 10. Uh, 5, 6, 7. Uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I'll just shit again. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the mastery, the quiz, I mean, hit it. Uh, we have 5, 10, 14, 15, 16. One, two, three, four, five, six, three by four, twelve. Okay. We have uh six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Four in some four in twelve. Three six or two nines or three six. One two three four five. One two three four five. Six. Four. Quiz one. I think I should be okay now. Although I think I could go on. What's next? This video. Quiz two. Prism unit test. Okay, I'm gonna do this tomorrow. Uh, okay.
I think I'm quite satisfied for now. Uh, so factors and multiples, reading encrypted data. Um, yeah, I guess this is part 12, this is part 13. Yeah. I guess what I can do is finish this one and then tomorrow would be with the negative numbers and coordinate plane. But I guess it's can that could be hard. Yeah, let's just do it this way for now. Okay, cool. Fifty six percent now. Um for the world of math. What? Hmm. Oh shit, I didn't even take a picture of that. 20%, cool. 20%. Right, I'm done. Gonna continue tomorrow. Or not actual tomorrow. Later tonight. So, yeah, this is part 13, and tomorrow's. Uh, I mean, tonight's gonna be part 14. Bye.